How long will you, how often will you refuse to keep my commandments, my laws? He's calling the Sabbath a law before Mount Sinai. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Does man need to rest? Does man need a specific time for worship? Yes, the principle comes from the very beginning. And sometimes people like to say because there's silence on something, it must not have existed. That is a very foolish logic to prove anything. You catch that? Because you, you don't hear a lot said about something to assume that it means it wasn't there or it didn't exist, you apply that same principle to other truths or other ideas in the Bible and you're going to get all kinds of strange beliefs. It's obvious that it was there. There's no commandment that says you're not supposed to commit adultery before Mount Sinai. But Joseph seemed to know that there was. Some of these things are very clearly implied. So this is the commandment. You'll notice it's the longest of the Ten Commandments. It is the only commandment that begins with the word remember. It's in the middle of God's law. And God takes more time with the Sabbath commandment explaining what that means in case they misunderstood. But here's the point I don't want you to miss. The Ten Commandments are an abbreviation of the law of God. For instance, when it says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain, does that commandment grow into great detail to explain every way a person could take God's name in vain? Or is that something for further study? You'll find other examples of that in the Bible. It doesn't in the Ten Commandments go into all the examples of how you could swear or claim to be a Christian and be a hypocrite and all that's involved in taking God's name in vain. You study out the details of that. In the commandment that says you shall not commit adultery. I just quoted it. That's pretty brief. I think you and I know there's a lot more to it than that one statement. What does that involve? How about two people that aren't married? Is it adultery then? And you've got a lot of things where it in, you invest some study and understanding how do you keep that commandment. There's, it's broader than the statement that you find etched in stone. Same thing with the Sabbath commandment. And God in His Word gives us a lot more detail about what is involved in keeping it holy. It does not mean that you simply swing in a hammock all day long and, you know, don't farm. That's not, there's a lot more to it than that. But it does give more detail in saying you are to rest... Your animals are to rest, servants are to rest, your families to rest, and everybody within your gates. And I'll talk more about uh, some of those specifics as we go on. I'll tell you what confuses people a little bit about the Sabbath. It's because it deals with time. Wesley tells a story about somebody who was a new convert to Christianity and very devout. And as the sun was going down before the Sabbath began, he was shining his shoes or cleaning his shoes and it took about 15 minutes to do each shoe and he got one shoe done and he looked at where the sun was and he knew he would not have the other shoe done before the sun went down and he decided to stop. Did he make the right decision? Went to church the next day, one shiny shoe and one dirty one. Fanatic. Is he? It's either right or it's wrong. You know, uh, during World War II, there were Christians and Jews in concentration camps that were told they had to go dig potatoes on the Sabbath and the Nazis loved showing the Jews that they were hypocrites. I have relatives that were uh, Jewish relatives that were over there and they'd make them go out and dig potatoes or work on the Sabbath and some of them were more devout and they would say I cannot do this. It's God's Sabbath and they were killed just like that. Others compromised. In the days of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they stood up, do you think they were the only Jews in the crowd that day? I'm sure there were some who bowed down. I'm ashamed and afraid to say that I am sure that there will be some Sabbath-keeping Christians that will go along with the world in the last days. That's why this message is important. And if you don't know how to make a decision to say, the sun is almost down, it will, the Sabbath will have begun, and this shoe is not done yet, but I'm going to do it anyway because that would be fanaticism, then you don't understand the principle. You see, time makes a difference. And in our minds we think, how can it be good and holy and fine to shine this shoe and then the few more ticks of the clock and all of a sudden it's a sin? 
I mean, it sounds strange to us. Let me use another illustration. A man might have a girl that he's very interested in. And it's inappropriate for him to gaze upon her without his, her clothes on, vice versa. But after they make some vows, suddenly what was a sin is now holy. Do little things like that make a difference? What at one moment was wrong, after the service, it is holy and it's good. So these, these words of God do make a difference. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego probably had some friends that were saying, Get down, are you crazy just this once? You're a fanatic. Yeah, the world, the church probably thought they were fanatics. But God honored them. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Timing makes a difference. Things change. And when God says, this is regular time for work, this is holy time. Now God commands us to keep it holy. What is holy? If we're going to keep it holy, we need to know what that means. Only a few things in the Bible are called holy. Marriage is called holy. Before a girl is married, she's available. Now you can, you know, make your bid and try to court or do whatever you want to do. But until she says, I do, I mean, she may have made a, uh, an engagement commitment. But it ain't over till it's over, right? And you've all heard stories how at the last minute the guy or the girl says, I can't do this, I really love her, or something else, you know. But once they're married, if they say that, it's holy. And a violation of that is profaning a marriage, it's called adultery, it's sacred. There is money, a percentage of money, that is called holy. The Bible says the tithe is holy unto the Lord. Now, it's hard for us to understand if I've got ten dollars in my wallet that one of them is holy. They all say in God we trust it'll just be a matter of time before they take that off, right? <laughs> but, you know, we've got to understand that whatever that, it's the first one I pull out and give at church, it's the first fruits, but one of them is holy. And you've got to be intelligent about that. And if I take the tithe that is set aside for God and I use it to make my VCR payment, that is profaning, it's a sin. You're taking something holy and you're making it common, that's a sin. And when you treat a married woman like she's not married, it's a sin. It's holy. There are some things that are holy and they should not be profane. God says the time of the Sabbath is holy, not because a church teaches it, not because it's a creed, but God said, I have sanctified it. I have blessed it. And nothing any man in the world can do changes that. You notice God doesn't say, remember the Sabbath day to make it holy? He doesn't ask you to make it holy. You can't. God is the one who declares something holy. And when He says, keep it holy, He says, I've already made it holy back in the beginning, before sin. Now I'm asking you to recognize what I have done and respect me. And it's all about a love relationship with God. Now, I'm going to begin with a few obvious points that uh, I think are important to understand. What should we do on the Sabbath? Now we'll talk about things that should be done and things that should not be done. You know, the Sabbath is one commandment. Some commandments are stated in the negative. The Sabbath is stated in the positive and the negative. It says, you shall keep it holy. You shall not work. It gives both sides. And so I'm approaching this message that way. First of all, I hope it's obvious to everybody that it's a day that we should go to church. How many of you believe that? It's a day for us to have corporate worship. When something's in print, it's fair game. Is that right? I mean, if you get bold enough to print something, then you can critique it. There was an article in the Review in April this year that I thought was appalling. The title of the article is Some Keep the Sabbath by Going to Church. And the implication is, all through the article, it kept saying, what's the point? And the only point I could get out of it is, you can keep the Sabbath by staying home just as well as you can keep it by going to church. And I thought, why on earth would the review print that? As much trouble as pastors already have impressing on people that it's a holy day to come together and worship, 
Why in the world? And this is the kind of stuff that makes me see that the devil is eroding very simple principles of 